So today we have uh, two great lectures on chest emergencies and ankle fractures. Dr. De Luigi will be talking to us on chest emergencies. I saw he had a nice article written and so he was the one that I picked for this topic. Um, but he comes from Mayo Clinic, Arizona, PM&R background, but is board certified in sports medicine, brain injuries, pain medicine, RMSK certified, so a lot of extra certifications. Um, he's the chair of PM&R there, director of sports medicine, but he has quite an extensive history um, over on the East Coast as well, started the sports medicine fellowship at MedStar Georgetown. He was the program director of PM&R at Walter Reed, um, team position for several Washington pro teams, um, internationally recognized in adaptive sports medicine and on several concussion groups as well. Um, and I'm Heather Saffel. I was the fellow representative of this committee last year from Emory and I'm now joining the faculty at the South Bend Notre Dame Fellowship. Um, I'll introduce Dr. Gillespie before her talk, but we'll go ahead and get started with chest emergencies by um, Dr. Dave Luigi. So go ahead and get started. Thanks Great. for having, uh, joining us today. Great, thanks everyone for joining. I'm gonna share my screen now. Stop sharing. Uh, is everybody able to see the title slide there? Looks good. Great. Uh, so today's trauma uh, topic is chest trauma in athletes. Uh, as mentioned, I'm, I'm Dr. DeLuigi. I am uh, currently the chair at PNOR at uh, Mayo Clinic, Arizona, where I also serve as the medical director for sports medicine. So. Advanced slide. There we go. Uh, today's learning objectives, uh, again, I'm going to talk about uh, having you develop knowledge of various injuries related to chest trauma in athletes. Uh, identify signs and symptoms of the various urgent and non-urgent injuries that may be sustained from chest trauma in athletes, as well as become familiar with treatments of these various uh, urgent and non-urgent uh, injuries sustained from chest trauma. The things that I'm going to talk about today, uh, again, uh, part of it is uh, where the uh, appendicular uh, aspect uh, will articulate with the, with the chest wall, uh, which can also be frequently injured, but uh, you know, runner's nipples, uh, sternoclavicular joint injuries, clavicular joint injuries, costochondral, chest wall contusions, pneumothorax, flail chest, sternal fractures, ribs, and commotio cardis. I did not have enough time to update the slide from the pneumothorax from the uh, injections uh, from that aspect, but that definitely something can occur as we've seen this week. So, you know, background, you know, chest problems are a, primary, uh, a frequent uh, visit uh, for, for primary care. You know, however, what we're looking for more in the athletic population is patients under 35. Uh, is cardiac causes are much less common, and oftentimes they may be traumatic or, or musculoskeletal or cardiopulmonary in general. So we'll be looking for you know, causes of this trauma uh, and they, they do increase with athletic participation. Various sports are more frequently uh, uh, associated with uh, trauma. Uh, and, and sometimes we'll, I'll talk about the, in, in some of the slides of uh, various sports that are more likely to occur with those various types of trauma. Chest trauma uh, can require immediate uh, treatment and it is concerning, but it overall it's relatively uncommon. You know, extreme sports are, are likely to increase the incidence of these life-threatening trauma incidents. Many of the, other, many of the sports that are high impact, high velocity, do have other protective equipment um, uh, you know, uh, when you get to uh, auto racing, uh, cy cycling, uh, as well as uh, you know, motorcycle racing and some of the more extreme sports now that you're having, they may not have that protective equipment. Uh, chest trauma that can be life, non-life threatening is much more common. And it's approximately 42% of the athletes will re 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 return to sports within one week. However, it's imperative to complete a thorough evaluation to assess for these potentially life-threatening conditions. So some of the risk factors for these, uh, uh, you know, for chest trauma that is life-threatening is high-velocity trauma. Uh, we're talking about, you know, skiing, you know, uh, you know uh, boating, uh, motor vehicle, uh, you know, bull riding, things along those lines can, uh, can lead to, uh, you know, these types of traumas. Rapid acceleration, deceleration, you'd have a direct impact to the chest. And, and frequently, if you have the lack of external protective equipment, sports like hockey and football have shoulder pads that cover portions of the chest. 
and the Amberson may provide some additional protection you know, from that and mitigate some of that risk. Now, looking at just general or non emergent injuries, so runner's nipples, muscle strains, intercostal, pectoral, costochondral pathology, slipping rib, costochondritis, and the precordial catch. So, the incidence of runner's nipples is noted about 2 to 16% of marathoners. It's caused by re repetitive friction across the shirt and the nipple. It results in painful erythematous and crusted nipples. Prevention, oftentimes we'll use petroleum jelly, skin lube, or a bandage or tape over the nipples to prevent this irritation. And the treatment is the same. Uh, and so depending on the extent of it, uh, antibiotic, antibiotic topical agents may also be beneficial. Muscle strains, uh, again, can be caused by macro or micro trauma. Uh, due, can be due to uncustom or excessive activity that occur. Oftentimes, it's upper body activity, uh, uh, can occur with a very forceful cough or from minor trauma. And so diagnosis and exam, we'll we be looking for pain that's gonna be between the ribs for the intercostal space. It's worth with movement or pressure, deep inspiration. You know, pain at that area of pressure. Treatments typically responds with NSAIDs, rest, and therapy. Uh, as noted, there was having a, one of the professional football players this week was having chest and rib pain and underwent a rib block in which they had a pneumothorax, uh, which would be a known complication. And therefore, one of those things, if they are going to be pursued, should be pursued with uh, advanced imaging uh, to, to make sure that uh, you're not uh, uh, causing that, uh, that uh, trauma to the, to the lung tissue. So. Pectoralis muscle injury, complete or incomplete uh, cause. Uh, oftentimes, it's going to be a history of pain. Can have an audible pop occurring when the arm is adducted and extended. They will be having chest pain. Uh, this, uh, you know, one of the most uh, prime examples recently was J.J. Watt, who had this occur last year. Uh, exam uh, pain, reveals pain, swelling, uh, tenderness, deformity, weakness with uh, adduction and internal rotation. A chest X-ray may be helpful with diagnosis, where you uh, where you have the absence of the pectoralis muscle. You know, so if you have the chest x-ray in your training room, uh, when you bring them back uh, for evaluation, that would be helpful. If you have an ultrasound, that would be even more helpful because you'd have that uh, readily available uh, and can see the soft tissue rather than looking for the absence of a shadow. Uh, an MRI is also going to be helpful for more definitive uh, evaluation as well. Uh, treatment uh, will range from rest to surgical repair depending on the extent of the injury. If it is mild, early range of motion in the first week is followed by strengthening in weeks three or four with return to play. And JJ Watt was able to return to play later that season and played in the playoff game last year. So, uh, costochondro separation, a slipping rib syndrome, also can known as other NAP acronyms for it is rib tip syndrome, clicking rib, slipping rib, cartilage syndrome, painful rib, nerve nipping, displaced ribs, or the 12th rib syndrome. Oftentimes, this is defined by pain in the lower chest or abdomen. There's tenderness along that lower costal margin and reproduction of pain with palpation. The location is most commonly at the 10th rib, followed by the 9th and 8th rib, but it can occur at any rib. History, uh, the recording of hearing of pop or with some sharp pain at the site of injury. You feel intermittent sharp stabbing pain, followed by a prolonged soreness. Your exam will reveal tenderness and swelling, uh, potentially with or without uh, deformity. And there may be a palpable click there when you push on the rib uh, as that cartilage overrides the bone. Diagnosis is mainly clinical. There is no specific imaging to confirm, but a dynamic ultrasound where you're pushing on the rib and seeing the rib and the cartilage click can be helpful. Radiographs are beneficial to exclude fracture uh, if you're going to pursue those and you have a clinical suspicion depending on the trauma. The treatment is usually rest, ice, analgesics. You can do a lidocaine or steroid injection. Again, the same risk factors with, the, with an injection, uh, you know, palpation based is, uh, can lead to complications such as pneumothorax and, you know, advanced imaging such as ultrasound or fluoroscopy should be utilized. The ultrasound, you can actually see the lung tissue moving. And so, and so you can make sure that you are you know, superficial to the pleura and the lung space. So 
manipulation. There has been some reports on osteopathic and chiropractic manipulation to pop the rib back into place and it can stabilize. It, uh, the, the, the extent of this can vary and it can take up to 12 weeks for some recalcitrant uh, 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 episodes with this. And if it comes chronic and is really hindering, the rib could always be removed, but that would be you know, something that would uh, obviously be occurring after you have extensive uh, trials of conservative management. So when we are looking at the slipping rib, there is some mixed prognosis on this. Uh, a prolonged course, there was one study that showed about 70% of them will have pain at eight years, uh, and, and the remainder were pain-free by 16 months. But as we noted before, some patients can get better in the first few weeks. So in this study here, they're looking at uh, excising the ribs. Uh, so this is where they're looking at it, so N equals 17 in the study and 82% were pain-free at seven days after the rib resection and 100% were uh, relieved at six weeks. So I added that in there because obviously these patients here are the more recalcitrant or refractory care and many of the other ones had, uh, had done well earlier. So, so, but this is something that would be beneficial if they are not getting better with conservative management. Costochondritis would be chest uh, wall pain and tenderness at the costochondral junction or the costal sternal joints. So it's likely an inflammatory process. Uh, if you get a gallium scan, it is frequently positive. It is unlikely to be degenerative or traumatic. There is another condition related to costochondritis, which is known as Tietze syndrome. And it's a distinct, uh, it's a distinct from a, the above one, which was just straight chondrocostochondritis by additional having swelling at the area. And so that's the main difference there. Precordial catch, uh, this is when we'll, the, the, also some people will call it like runner's splint. Uh, demographics, again, rare occurring above the age of 35. If, there, if somebody's coming into you, uh, uh, you need to roll out cardiac pathology. Uh, the differentiation for this is that it usually uh, presents as sharp stabbing pain in the precordial or left sternal region without radiation of pain to the, to the jaw or left upper extremity as compared to that deep crushing pressure that you would typically feel with cardiac. You know, but not everybody presents the same and therefore it is imperative that you do assess for a, a, a cardiac, a, acute cardiac issue. So. Can be uh, uh, occur with rest or with mild or moderate exercise. It is thought to be due to pleural origin and not true cardiac origin. Uh, diagnosis is rule out other uh, cardiopulmonary conditions, and usually re responds with repositioning or stretching. You know, uh, many people will kind of if, if they're jogging and you get that, they may change their pace, take a break, get some water, and, and get back to running with that and go from there. But again, if they present to you with this it's imperative to rule out cardiopulmonary, uh, other cardiopulmonary issues. Chest wall contusions, uh, this is where we move from the, some of those ones that are relatively atraumatic, but can from, from micro traumas, as mentioned before, uh, to some more of the, the blunt trauma. Uh, so our physical exam, again, looking for any gross deformities, you know, uh, seeing if there's any you know, uh, abnormal chest wall movement or crepitation, you want to auscultate the heart and lungs fringe, you know, cardio or pulmonary damage, you know, making sure that there's not, it, with the blunt force trauma, making sure there's no rib fractures or pneumothorax or flail chest, which we'll go into later. So complications of this blunt wall trauma or related to an extension of the contusion alone can be commotiocardis, cardiopulmonary contusion, hemothorax and pneumothorax. So these are all things you need to rule out. If you've been able to do that and your final conclusion is that it's just a chest wall bruise or contusion, then the treatment is usually minor. Uh, it's rest, ice, non-steroidals, and if there is a local hematoma there, you may be able to drain it. Again, anytime you're putting a needle near the chest wall uh, because of risk of uh, damage to the underlying lung tissue, uh, you should use advanced imaging. Return to play uh, is symptom dependent. Uh, you may use a flak jacket to help protect that area. Other emergent conditions from, the, from trauma. This is where the, it gets potentially more complicated and we, we may need to 
act much more aggressively depending on what's what, what's going on. And I'll go through each of those. So rib fractures, the, there can be lucencies. They fall in one of three groups. There's an acute fracture, which is from severe direct trauma. Indirect trauma, which is retraction of the neck or muscles from like an MVA, coughing, lifting, you know, uh, you know stress fractures, which can be a different patterns, either in the first rib or any of the other ribs. First rib stress fractures usually result in an anterior scalene force from overhead activities such as baseball, basketball, tennis, or weightlifting. Others are from the serratus anterior force from downward stabilizing force such as rowing or golf. And there can be a congenital defect. Rib injuries in general, ribs are more flexible in younger patients. So, uh, so basically you, if they have a chest wall trauma or rib trauma, have a high clinical suspicion for an underlying injury. And so first rib injuries are rare, but if you do, make sure you ev evaluate for pulmonary and neurovascular function in that extremity. History is trauma with localized pain and tenderness, swelling and bruising. The pain can occur with inspiration and cough. A stress fracture may also occur, you know, secondary to after the trauma, uh, as repetitive forces are put over that area. Radiographs may be able to do it. Bone scan can also help confirm the diagnosis. Fracture of the lower two ribs may injure the spleen and liver, so we need to assess for those types of uh, injuries for our internal organs. And treatment is usually rest, ice, analgesic, and rib belts. And if there are other complications, you'd address those as well appropriately and it will be described later. So here's one of the bone scans you can see where the rib is lit up on, on the bone scan. Pain can occur at the shoulder, anterior, neck, clavicular region. Again, it depends on where it's at. Pain may refer to a lateral upper arm. It can be worse with deep inspiration. Oftentimes you'll have the tenderness at the site of injury, you know, but you also may have tenderness that may be uh, coming from the superior angle of the scapula, supraclavicular triangle, or deep in the axilla. Plane graphs can oftentimes be negative, and so if you have a high clinical suspicion, other imaging such as the bone scan, MRI, or CT scan may be useful. Again, uh, a lot of stress fractures occur in, in sports such as rowing. Uh, it's an insidious onset of vague uh, discomfort leading to sharper pain. Oftentimes it's in the posterior thorax. Radiation can uh, occur along the rib and it can also irritate the intercostal nerve. Deep inspiration, deep palpation and provocative overuse of motions cause pain. Other areas where you have stress fractures or the rib, uh, ribs are, would be from golfing. Uh, and so again, but in general management uh, is usually uh, try to get better with some pain-free rest uh, over about a four to six week period. Gradual reintroduction at sports, most are improved by eight to 10 weeks. Rowers are usually about four weeks uh, because of the more linear motion that they're doing. And golfers are typically closer to eight weeks because of the rotational component that they add into that. Again, you may wanna look at technique and underlying the other bone health causes such as the female athlete triad or any endocrine or metabolic uh, disease or steroid use to see where they occurred for the stress fracture. Acute fractures are more going to be direct trauma. So the person's going to get hit and you're going to be looking for the uh, for pain in the area that they're, that they're pointing to where, where their discomfort's at. They may have difficulty breathing. Again, the goal here is symptomatic pain relief. And, you know, again, beware of complications. You know, pneumothorax, splenic rupture, flail chest. So, so what is flail chest? It's a portion of the rib cage that separates from the chest wall and moves independently often paradoxical with lung expansion. It requires fractures in at least two ribs in two places each. So uh, may not be immediately apparent due to splinting of the chest wall, but it may even interfere with the pulmonary me mechanics as well, and it can be lethal. Uh, if you identify a fell chest, these should be report transported immediately to the emergency department. Again, the mechanism is direct trauma, segmental rib fractures at least two locations, uh, or at least of at least three ribs. And so diagnosis is paradox clinical uh, paradoxical breathing and chest x-ray would be, uh, be able to identify this. Treatment is aggressive pain control. Depending on uh, how it interferes with pulmonary function, it may require ventilation and surgery may be considered. Return to play is when the fractures are healed without any respiratory compromise. Pneumothorax can occur traumatic or spontaneous. The spontaneous blood rupture can cause a sudden compressive force or a displaced rib fracture. 
Both can be associated with tachypnea, dyspnea, and sudden chest pain. A simple versus tension uh, pneumothorax it can lead to shifting of the mediastinal structures. Tension may also lead to tachypnea, uh, to tachycardia, uh, uh, neck distension of the veins, and hypotension. The mechanism would be spontaneous or post-traumatic where air is trapped between the visceral pleura and the lung or the parietal pleura of the chest wall. Clinically, they'd have chest pain, shortness of breath, deep breath sounds, hyperresonant lung fields with percussion. Uh, tension pneumothorax would have a uh, trachea deviated away from the injury and the distended neck veins. Chest x-ray, ultrasound, or CT may be useful. Again, it requires a quick diagnosis uh, uh, and some assessment of signs and symptoms. Physical exam may show those decreased breath sounds or hyperresonance on the affected side. And x-rays will be confirmatory, but suggested pneumothorax should not wait for the films. So the treatment would be based on the degree and stability. You know, a rapid assistance with needle decompression, inserting a large gauge needle into the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line of the affected side. Tension and significant uh, simple requires a chest tube and thoracostomy. Uh, small, under 20% simple pneumothorax may be treated with close observation. So. Again, to kind of summarize that as a treatment, if they're stable, you can observe them. If the pneumothorax is under 20% with serial chest x-rays. If they are unstable, you would need to do a needle decompression if there's a tension. Uh, pneumothorax at the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, side of the injury. Chest tube may also be warranted depending on the, the, the circumstances. Return to play is resolution of the pneumothorax and chest ray, and you would avoid flying for two weeks after resolution. Sternal fractures are rare. Uh, when they do occur, again, these are high velocity, high impact sports. Uh, they're usually with direct tra trauma, flexion compression, pain is aggravated by deep inspiration, plain radiographs, particularly a lateral chest film. CT may be helpful, especially when you're looking at you know, damage to the underlying uh, uh, major organs there with the heart and lungs. Uh, this again should be referred to the emergency department. Uh, Non-displaced sternal fractures can improve with rest, ice, and analgesics. It can, can potentially return between six and 12 weeks. If there is a displaced fracture, oftentimes it requires surgical destruction, and you really need to have additional assessment for interthoracic organ trauma. Sternoclavicular joint injury, maybe traumatic or atraumatic, can sublux, dislocate, or fracture. Chronic injury can be degenerative. Medial clavicular physis can be vulnerable to fracture in a patient's under 24. Imaging, uh, the serendipity view uh, on plain x-rays can be helpful, and that's an AP of the SC joint at a 40 degree uh, cephalic tilt. CT scans can be helpful also if you're looking for a posterior dislocation with compression on some of the neurovascular structures. Uh, dislocation can occur anterior or posterior. If it is posterior, you really have to observe for potential tracheal and, uh, and bat neurovascular injury. If it's an anterior uh, dislocation, reduction can help and immobilize for four to six weeks with a clavicular strap. Posterior is gonna be reduction under general anesthesia with an immobilization with a figure of eight strap for four to eight weeks. Return to play will occur with a four course of immobilization with no continued evidence of instability. So, uh, you know, typically, you know, all do better if they're reduced early. Anterior is more common and, and has less uh, likelihood for respiratory neurovascular compromise, but you need to look at that and often does well conservatively. A complete anterior dislocation, however, may require a closed reduction. And uh, again, you also want to advantage that with a figure of eight. Posterior dislocation has a 30% injury to the vital structures. So this area you're looking for signs and symptoms, hoarseness, dyspnea, dysphagia may occur if there is uh, in tracheal or esophageal involvement and uh, requires immediate evaluation in the emergency department. Clavicular fractures, mid-shaft is the most common. These again will usually be treated with a sling or figure of eight with analgesic meds and ice. Surgical indications would be if there's neurovascular, severe tenting, other major trauma you know, to the area. Usually you can, can, if they don't need surgery, that's back in about three months. Uh, if they do need surgery, it's case dependent. Proximal fracture, clavicle fractures would be treated similar to the SC joint injury. You know, distal clavicle fractures would be more likely to require surgery. You know, again, the, the non-operative and return to play is usually about three months to the end case dependent. 
Pulmonary contusion would occur with a blunt force to the lung tissue, resulting in edema and hemorrhage. Children are more prone uh, to this because of the elasticity of the chest wall, and they won't have the wrist fracture. And so looking for signs and symptoms, cough, homoptosis, shortness of breath, dyspnea, diminished breath sounds, rails, fluffy infiltrates on x-rays, as you can see there on the left. Uh, limited fluid intake, rest, and initial ventilator support may be beneficial. Cardiac contusion is often a rapid deceleration, compression against the sternum. Cycling, skiing, parachuting, rock climbing, race car driving would be sports that you may see this in. A significant cardiac events are rare, but if they do occur, they're usually happening in the first 24 hour. So it'd be beneficial to monitor, perhaps depending on the, the extent of the trauma, with telemetry, vitals, and, and persistent examination to include auscultation and venous neck distension. Initial EKG is the best predictor. Now, poor prognostic capability uh, would also have been potentially following the CPKs, uh, echocardiogram, and gated pool scans. And the other concern would be commotio cordis. So commotio cordis is the mechanism of initiation and arrhythmia following a blunt trauma to the precordium prior to the peak of the T wave. Diagnosis is a collapse of athlete following a direct trauma to the chest. Arrhythmia is noted on AED uh, with predominantly the fib. Uh, autopsy needed to usually exclude other uh, potential causes. The treatment is you need to follow ACLS guidelines for immediate for cardiac arrest. Uh, return to play if you have an AD uh, available and you're able to defibrillate. Uh, the patient would need a full cardiac evaluation to rule out other possible causes, and then they, you would recommend potential improved chest protection moving forward. Other traumas may lead to cardiac tamponade or pericardial effusion, which would be increased accumulation of fluid in the pericardial sac. Can present with chest pain and dys dyspnea. While, uh, pain may be worsened while lying flat and improve while upright. Also may have hypotension, jugular venous distension, muffled heart sounds, and EK, a, a ECG can be uh, beneficial. Uh, other imaging would include a chest x-ray, echo, and CT or MRI potentially. Treatment, if they're stable, it's usually observation. If they're unstable, may require emergency drainage. I would recommend that that would be tra 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 transitioned to the emergency department and, or potentially with cardiovascular surgery uh, to do that, not to be done uh, on the sideline if necessary. But uh, again, if it's going to be life-saving and it's something you're able to do, It'd be of consideration, uh, but again, echocardiogram shows no sign of active disease process. One last thing that kind of falls in that would be FS thrombosis. I, it, it's a lot from a more direct trauma, but it'd be a thrombosis in the subclavian or axillary vein. It's most common or repetitive overhead pictures. Uh, symptoms include pain, swelling of the arm, potential numbness, uh, and signs include edema, venous, uh, venous prominence, and uh, diagnosis with ultrasound abrography. I have seen this one in, in a D1 college baseball pitcher uh, that had come. I had seen him previously for elbow pain several years before, and he came back and was referred for an EMG because he was having arm numbness, and we found that he ended up having an effort thrombosis in his subclavian vein. So rare, but it's possible. Treatment is his rest, elevation, and then anticoagulation. These are references that I've used for today's talk and uh, questions and discussions here. And I will stop sharing my screen. And my other part popped down, so. And, oh, I'm gonna stop Feel there free it is. to go ahead and submit your questions in the chat. Thank you, Dr. DeLuigi, that was great. You're welcome. Definitely a lot of topics to cover and you hit, hit the highlights on them, so that was awesome. Tried my best. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in today to the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. Um, we have uh, just finished one great talk. We have another one coming up. Um, remember to submit your questions in the chat. Looks like we have one. Um, this one's from Dr. Zaremski. Um, any thought on plain CT versus CT with contrast for concerns of a posterior sternoclavicular joint injury? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, both can be utilized. Uh, a plain CT can show benefit. Adding contrast can also enhance some of the imaging from that. So part of the other aspect would be you know, uh, would they be able to take contrast? Do they have any other conditions such as kidney disorder or anything along those lines? Or depending on if there's a multi-trauma, 
uh, from that standpoint. Uh, it, the CT with contrast may add additional benefit to look uh, at other aspects of the, the injury too. Usually it's gonna be a high velocity trauma uh, when you're having that, so that's gonna be pushing that sternoclavicular joint back. So there would definitely be some potential benefit uh, of the contrast. Thank you. Um, and I actually, I sent out to about four different young sports medicine doctors, like any questions for these two lectures coming up today and all four groups brought up Tyrod Taylor, of course. Um, and it's awesome that you're RMSK certified as well. I know you already included the return to play for pneumothorax, which I'm sure a lot of people are curious about, but what are your thoughts on how not to drop a lung when doing rib injections? Any I'm sure absolutely. I was so, uh, wondering about rib injections, especially right now. Absolutely. I, my, my, my topic couldn't have had better timing, I guess, as far as bringing it up. But for Tyrod Taylor, I'm, I'm sorry that he had to go through that. So not knowing the situation of what the, what the, you know, what the physician was doing or if he used guidance or not, um, you know, I can't specifically comment on what they did, but I can comment on what would be best practices. So best practices Historically, before there was ultrasounds, uh, we used to do the rib blocks with uh, fluoroscopy. You'd be able to see the rib and you'd touch the rib down and you'd, you'd curve the tip of the needle and then you would spin the needle tip around the edge of the rib to the intercostal nerve uh, and do the block that way. Once I started having training in ultrasound, um, I've never done another fluoroscopic guided uh, uh, injection and I can never imagine ever doing one palpation based. Uh, once you're able to visualize both ribs uh, and you're able to see the pleural space as well as the underlying lung tissue as it's dynamically moving on the ultrasound. Uh, if you cl click on Doppler ultrasound, you could see the, the intercostal neurovascular area right next to the nerve as well and you should be able to uh, you know, move the needle. I would do an in-plane view. I use the one rib, so if you could see my hands, are, I would use the one rib as a backdrop and I would come down underneath the needle right to the other rib, right in through here. And you can see the underlying soft tissue moving up and down underneath it. If your needle tip is moving in a trajectory that is going further south, uh, you need to halt and back the needle up and re, re, uh, uh, reposition uh, to make sure that you are not going too deep. Uh, obviously, that is the number one complication we all try to avoid. And I can only imagine what that provider is going through right now uh, from that standpoint. But uh, if you do due diligence and you utilize imaging, it sh should be avoided. So. Great. Thank you. Um... I don't see any other questions yet, uh, so I will go ahead and thank you, Dr. DeLuigi, and I'll yeah. introduce, introduce Heather Gillespie. Um, she is coming to us from Maine Medical Center, where she's the Sports Medicine Fellowship Director. She's also a Clinical Associate Professor at Tufts University School of Medicine, and she's the head team physician for the Maine Red Claws of the NBA G League. Um, she is going to talk to us today about ankle fractures. So we thank you for um, joining us and I'll go ahead and let you get started. Great, thank you. Can everyone, can you hear me and see my slides? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. So thank you, Heather, and thank you to the Education Committee um, and the Fellowship Committee for having me today um, and for all of you for coming to participate. So. We're gonna talk about ankle fractures today. I have no relevant disclosures. We will start with the anatomy um, and then talk about diagnosis, both uh, looking at stable versus unstable fractures because that really uh, changes your treatment. Um, we'll talk about treatment and reasons to refer and then finish up with some pediatric considerations. So the ankle joint, um, pretty basic, but um, we have the distal tibia, the distal fibula, and the talus, which forms the talocrural joint. Um, on the inside, we have the deltoid ligaments. On the outside, we have the ATFL, the PTFL, and CFL. And then the ligamentous complex that we're most sort of 
not concerned about, but becomes important um, in ankle fractures is the syndesmosis. So that's a complex made up of the anterior and posterior inferior tib fib ligaments. So here's your anterior and here's your posterior, and then the interosseous membrane, so in here. So that complex keeps the tib-fib together and be, um, becomes really important when we talk about instability. Other anatomy pieces uh, that you should be aware of, there's something called the tibial plafond. So that's the inferior distal tibia. So it's this sort of shelf that sits over the Taylor dome. And one reason that I bring this up and that it's important to think about is that's actually broader in the front than the back, as is the talus. So here's the um, sort of from a bird's eye view, here's your talus and the talar dome is broader in the front than the back. So when the ankle comes up into dorsiflexion, it sort of locks in. So, um, so when the ankle then is in plantar flexion, it's looser and more vulnerable. And that's when a lot of your injuries occur, both sprains as well as fractures. So just keep that in mind when you're evaluating folks. Another anatomy concept to think about is the ring of the ankle mortis. So if you think about all the ligaments that stabilize and keep things together and then the bones, um, if you have a single break, so you break one side, um, it tends to be stable. But as soon as you have a double break, you're at risk of having instability and then that can lead to um, more long-term consequences if not treated appropriately. So you can have a ligament on one side and a bone fracture on the other, two bone fractures, two ligament injuries, um, but keep that in mind in terms of uh, stability. So to sort of illustrate our history and physical exam, I just wanted to bring up a case, which is always good to go through. So we have a 34-year-old female who presents with ankle pain. Surprise, surprise, that's his talk about ankle fractures. Um, two days prior, she was hiking in muck boots up here in Maine and slipped on a rock. Uh, she had immediate pain, it was hard for her to walk. She limped home and she had swelling and pain. Uh, she used some home care of elevation, ice, and rest. She said it was bruised all over and she really can't walk on it anymore. She had to get some friend's crutches, so that's why she came in to see you. So this just illustrates some key points, right? On your history, you wanna talk about the location, what makes it better, what makes it worse, are there any other injuries? Was it high impact or low impact? If you can ask, and a lot of times patients don't really know, but you can inquire about the ankle position at the time of injury, and are they able to bear weight? On physical exam, you always wanna examine the uninjured side. So what's normal, right? So is it swollen, is it not? Um, you wanna be sure, <clears throat> excuse me, to examine the full length of the tib fib, right? That proximal fibula, you don't wanna miss. Um, and ankle, the joint above, joint below, so the knee and foot as well. On inspection, look for swelling, any deformities, any open wounds, that's gonna change your management. Palpation-wise, a lot of times ankles just hurt all over, but if you can really find the point of maximal tenderness, that can sometimes um, help guide your diagnosis. Uh, you look at passive range of motion, active range of motion, and weight-bearing status all play a role do a good neurovascular exam, and don't forget to, you know, think out of the box a little bit and make sure you monitor for signs of compartment syndrome if you have higher level trauma. Some special tests you can do, similar, you know, we're always sort of trying to figure out, is it a sprain or a fracture? Where do we go from here? So the squeeze test is when you squeeze the tib-fib together um, more proximally, and then you look for pain that radiates distally to that lower syndesmosis uh, towards the ankle joint. The intra-jaw test um, illustrated here, but you grasp the tibia, then your um, hand under the calcaneus and pull forward and you look again for laxity and comparing both sides. The dorsiflexion external rotation test, things come by other names, but basically you dorsiflex, you externally rotate the foot. Um, and again, that stresses that syndesmosis and you wanna um, look for pain and symptoms there as well. That can also be used for um, stress x-rays. So we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So moving right into radiology, 
there are something called the Ottawa, Ottawa ankle rules and foot rules that you should all be familiar with if you're not already. And just in brief, um, the Ottawa ankle rules require that you have tenderness in the posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus or the medial malleolus um, up to six centimeters and the inability to bear weight. So those are keys and if you have a positive um, rule then it's um, sort of indicated to get an x-ray. If those are negative it's less likely. And then the foot rules just to review if you have tenderness of, at the navicular and the fifth metatarsal that's a positive. So if you've decided to move on with radiology and we're talking fractures so we always get x-rays um, the three major views you want to get are the AP lateral and mortis view. And then you want to also consider stress views, and that can be with gravity, so having the patient bear weight. And they really need to bear weight, so because you want to have that pressure down to stress the mortis. And then if you have tenderness at the uh, proximal fibula, you want to get a full-length tib-fib view. So some examples of that. Here's your AP view. This is the lateral. And some of these have findings, but we'll get back to those as we move through the talk. And then here is your mortis. And you can see here the difference between the mortis view and the AP. The mortis is an AP, but the foot is then internally rotated or adducted a bit. Um, so you really want to get those equal joint spaces. That's what you're looking for. So both sides as well as the top, the superior, medial, and lateral aspects should be equal. And whenever we get x-rays, I just like to point out that one view is no view. If you just had this x-ray, you'd say, that looks pretty normal. Um, but you want to look at your lateral view, and you can see this nice posterior malleolar fracture line here, which could be missed if you were too focused on the AP or the mortis view. So just remember, look at your own x-rays and um, examine all your views. And this is just to give you some quick follow-up on this patient. Um, here's a fracture nine weeks later with conservative treatment. You have some great callus formation and complete resolution of that fracture line. So x-rays are really our gold standard. I just wanted to um, make a quick point. MRI is usually not indicated in an acute injury. Um, they are better to evaluate ligamentous integrity, um, OCD lesions, more in a chronic ankle uh, situation. Ultrasound can be used um, to detect x-rays, so that's a great new tool that we have that we can even use on the sideline, um, you know, because that can show soft tissue as well as um, bony abnormalities. Um, CT scans are sometimes used for surgical planning, so if you have a really complex fracture and you're worried about joint step-off, a CT is going to better um, delineate that. So it, it could come into consideration for, for some things, but um, mostly your x-ray is going to be your um, sort of gold standard modality. So fracture patterns, um, some other things to sort of know about and help you evaluate your patient. An avulsion fracture usually is transverse. So these are nice schematics, I think. So an avulsion, so if that ligament pulls down on the bone, it usually creates a transverse fracture. So then sometimes you can get an impaction on the other side which is actually shown here, right? So if it, you get an impaction, you get more of an oblique pattern. Um, and, but this also, again, shows you the importance of always examining the opposite side, right? So you can have a ligamentous injury and then a bony injury, but you may only obviously see one on x-ray. These are some x-rays just showing that difference. Here's your transverse fracture. This is a nice x-ray that sh sort of shows, illustrates that transverse, that's the avulsion, and you can picture how that talus sh shifted and caused an oblique fracture from an impaction on the other side. Classification systems, there are a bunch out there. I think the most common used in, um, in our specialty um, is the Dennis Weber, so um, more commonly known as the Weber classification. That's based on the fibula fracture and the location of the fracture in, in relation to the mortis. Just so that you're aware, there is something called Lang-Hansen as well as AO, um, but due to the nature of this talk, we're just gonna move right through and uh, try to cover what we can here. So the Danis Weber system, a Weber A, is a fracture below the mortis, okay? And the syndesmosis is often intact. 
a Weber B is right at the mortise, and usually you have this oblique pattern. And the syndesmosis, again, is usually intact, but those are the ones you want to sort of take a good look at and get those stress views if indicated. And then a Weber C is above um, the mortise, and usually the syndesmosis is also uh, impacted in those. Some x-ray examples here. Here's your a pretty classic Weber A. You've got a transverse fracture through the distal fibula. This is actually also an A. So this is an accessory ossicle, but our real fracture is just this tiny little avulsion on the tip of the fibula. I think I have a bigger picture here. So this is also considered an A, right? So it's a distal fibula fracture below the level of the mortise. This fracture here, this is actually our hiker. This is our case. Um, and we have this oblique fracture, which you can see, here's the fracture line through here. It comes up through here, but really where the bone meets that tib fib articulation is right at the mortise. So this is considered a Weber B. And then you can see it um, uh, also on this lateral view as well. But this is what, this one is really what helps you characterize it the best because you can see where that fracture line comes out. So let's move on to treatment. So this is our Weber A sort of isolated malleolar fractures. And again, so we have a transverse fracture, a little avulsion fracture. This one's a, a little bit more chronic. So small non-displaced fractures. Um, you can treat with early immobilization, similar to an ankle sprain. So these are uh, very similar to, let's say, a grade uh, three ankle sprain, right? So there is complete disruption, but in general, they're very stable. Um, you can use a brace or a functional stirrup splint um, and really rehab as tolerated. I do find that patients often are still very uncomfortable, maybe very swollen, and they do benefit occasionally from wearing a walking boot for about a week or so just to get them ambulating um, comfortably. And then, but it can be a very quick transition to a brace uh, and functional rehab. And then moving on to these more oblique fractures, you really want to check for stability. So you want to get those weight bearing views. You want to check for that medial joint space um, widening right on your mortise view. But if you determine they are stable, these can be treated in a short leg walking cast or fracture boot for about four to six weeks. You wanna maintain about 90 degrees of um, dorsiflexion, right? So pretty neutral there to minimize your Achilles shortening. And compliance is really key, right? A fracture boot only works if you wear it. So for our younger patients um, and even some of our older patients, uh, sometimes you need to put them in a cast because you know if they're not gonna comply, then there is um, a risk either for delayed union or um, obviously if there's a little question of stability, you want to just make sure that this heals up and they don't have long-term um, complications. So in about seven to 10 days, you want to follow up for that x-ray check, make sure there's been no um, shifting of your fragments. At four weeks, if they're non-tender and things are stable, they can uh, move on to gradual weight bearing and range of motion. If there's no sign of healing, um, as in this patient, so this again is our hiker, she had some callus, but she was still really tender. Um, and you can still see those fracture lines. So we actually kept her in for another couple weeks. She did very well in the end, but she just needed a little bit more mobilization. So reasons to refer. Uh, open fractures. And depending on your sports medicine fracture um, practice, you may manage some of these things in um, sort of in conjunction with your orthopedic um, colleagues. But just in general, um, I would say if it's unstable, like a bimalleolar, trimalleolar fracture, those should be um, referred. If, you're, if you have a displaced medial malleolar fracture more than two millimeters, again, you wanna think about getting that reduced, any syndesmotic disruption. Proximal fibular fractures, again, those just tend to be a little bit more unstable. A posterior malleolar fracture, if it's non-displaced, uh, you can treat that as well, but if, if it gets displaced or uh, more than two millimeters or involves 25% of the articular surface, those again, um, you really want to get those into position as much as possible. Um, the ankle is, you know, it takes a lot of weight over time um, and any slight variation in its uh, biomechanics 
can really lead to um, earlier onset of um, post-traumatic arthritis and obviously complications. So um, the goal really of stabilization is less than one millimeter of displacement in any view. Some examples of things you probably want a little help with managing. Um, this is obviously significant medial joint space widening. This is a, well, it could be a bimalleolar, but as soon as you get that posterior I and mean, lateral view, you see that now you have a trimalleolar fracture. So that needs a little bit of reduction. An example here, um, and this is your Mason new fracture. So you have some medial joint space widening. And then on this view, I'll just point it out there, there's your medial joint space widening. And then we have our proximal fibula fracture. And sort of that's the mechanism. So you get the energy goes up through the ligaments, tears your ligaments, goes up and then comes out through the proximal fibula. So this is your classic Mason new fracture. This one is unstable given the um, widening. If it's stable, that's something you can treat, um, but really, again, get those stress views and, um, and watch this closely. So moving on to pediatric considerations. Kids are great, they heal really well, and it's fun to watch their bones remodel. Um, in kids, you need to remember that their ligaments are stronger than their bone. So what would be an ankle sprain in your uh, young adult or um, master's athlete uh, is more likely a fracture in a kid. So that physis, that growth plate that they have is really the weak point. And they're very common. Um, most common in boys uh, between nine and 14, that might just have to do with physical activity as well. And again, in kids, your goal is to achieve, achieve reduction and avoid growth arrest. Classification systems in kids um, are a little bit different because of the growth plate. And this classification is uh, for all peds uh, fractures, not just the ankle, just a caveat there. So Salter 1 fracture is a fracture through the physis. Salter 2 is fractured through the metaphysis um, and the physis. 3 is the epiphysis. 4 is sort of a combo of 2 and 3. And a Salter 5 fracture is a, a crush injury. So those are tougher to sometimes pick up on and that usually requires a comparison view. So let's talk about kids' distal fibula fractures, okay? So the lateral malleolus, also known as, as the fibula, that's one in the same. Salter Harris, one are the most common. And so on this, you may not see any x-ray changes. Um, this will be characterized by basically just local tenderness and swelling. Um, when you palpate, know your anatomy, know where that physis is, um, you know, depending on the size of the bone, sort of think about where that is when you're palpating. Um, and they often have point tenderness there. So it's a lot of times it's a clinical diagnosis. So any non-displaced type one and two fractures of the distal fibula, okay, the smaller bone, um, you treat with a short leg walking cast for about three to four weeks. They heal really well. Um, and here's an example of a Salter two. If it is displaced or unstable, again, you wanna get that reduced, usually fixing the tibia uh, stabilizes the fibula. So often it's a both bone fracture if it is unstable, but these one and two fractures really um, uh, pretty easy to treat. Again, short leg walking cast or a cast, I'm, I'm sorry, or a, um, a boot if, if your patient is compliant. In terms of the tibia, so the, the bigger bone, it takes a little bit more force and um, you know carries more of the weight. Again, the type one are difficult to detect on x-ray Swelling, tenderness, you have some, you know, if you palpate here, it's going to hurt um, sort of maximally. There's other places it might hurt. Um, and treatment there, non-displaced type one and twos, you, for type one, you can treat with a short leg walking cast for about four weeks. For the type two, you wanna be a little bit more conservative in kids. And um, even if it's non-displaced, they do recommend a long leg cast for the first uh, two to three weeks until that fracture gets stable. So after about two weeks, kids' bones get pretty sticky. Like they usually don't have too much displacement after uh, two weeks because of the amount of growth they have. And then you can uh, transition to that uh, short leg walking cast. But 
Just remember those distal tibia type two fractures, you wanna be a little bit more conservative with. And whenever you're concerned about um, a fracture through the growth plate, um, you want to consider getting x-rays every six uh, months and probably up sort of, sort of for two years to watch their growth. There's something called a Parkeris growth arrest line, which um, I think are really interesting. I actually just saw this patient the other day and she has a great growth arrest line. So right here, you can see this sclerotic line, which lies parallel to her physis. She had seen me about nine months prior and I had diagnosed her with a Salter 1 fracture, actually of her, both her fibula and her tibia. She happened to come in nine months later with a new, a new injury. Um, so these were her original x-rays um, back last December. You can see that there's, she has a little accessory ossicle here, um, but in general, her vices, um, you know, look very open and normal. And just going back, now you can see how nine months later, she's had this much growth, but basically it's like a ring on the tree. What you wanna look for here is not just the line, but that the line is parallel. So if there's any asymmetry or a little sort of blip in the line, that may indicate that you're getting asymmetric growth. Um, and so that's something to follow and obviously, um, you know, treat if, if needed. So that's a Parkeris growth arrest line. So in kids, reasons to refer, um, if you can't maintain a reduction and so that you need more internal fixation, any displaced intraarticular fracture, a displaced physeal fracture, right? So you can think about how this is now potentially affecting the growth plate there. And if so, uh, any massive soft tissue injury, it's another reason to think about. And if so, um, just place them in a bulky dressing, trying to stabilize in a splint and uh, keep them non-weight bearing until definitive treatment. A couple more just um, sort of pearls on pediatric fractures in the ankle. Um, there's something called a TLO fracture. There's also a triplane fracture, but this uh, represents a TLO. And it's unique to kids. And the reason is this physis down here, this growth plate, the fusion starts actually in the middle. So it starts in the middle and then it goes medial and then it goes lateral. So at some point in growth, usually in uh, adolescence, um, early adolescence, there's a point where really what's all that's open is sort of this lateral aspect and it, it's vulnerable. So you can get these fractures where it sort of pulls off that corner, um, and that's called a TLO fracture. Um, if they're non-displaced, you can manage them um, similar to a lot of the other fractures we've talked about, um, but you do want to start in a long leg cast here um, and make sure the foot is in internally rotated. Basically, you're trying to reduce that in, so sort of make sure it stays back in its place there. And here again, you can see that vulnerable fragment here that's been pulled off. Um, if it's greater than two millimeters, you want to make sure we get that reduced. Other things that make kids unique, just like distal radius uh, buccal fractures, kids can get um, distal tibia and fibula buccal fractures. So here's an x-ray here. Um, you need to look closely, right? So tibia looks good. We've got nice growth plates uh, and physis, um, epiphyses, sorry, starting here. And you look really closely, there's a buccal fracture real, right here on that distal fibula. And then I've also put in the four week later x-rays. So I sort of gave you both at once here, but um, four weeks later, you can see this great periosteal uh, remodeling. Um, this is really strained up and this kid is, you know, probably running around. <laughs> After two weeks, they were probably running around, but, um, you know, heal really well. So buccal fractures. Here's a couple more examples of that. Um, here we have a distal uh, tibia and fibula buccal fracture. So here's your buccal here. You can see it there on the lateral view. You can also see those changes right there and across. A couple weeks later in the cast, you start to see some, um, you can see some early periosteal elevation and callus formation here, some bony remodeling. And then a month later, uh, about six weeks from the injury, these are, and you see this great remodeling here, you can see it on the lateral view, and then that fibula um, also had a buccal fracture, and you can see how it's remodeled as well. 
Uh, one more point um, about accessory ossification centers. So these can also uh, throw learners off a little bit. So if you get this x-ray, let's say incidentally, and you you can see like there's a little bony fragment here, there's some bony fragments here. So are those real? Are those fractures? Um, and sometimes it's not clear. Um, so they're called, these, these accessory ossification centers off the tibia are, are the os subtibiali and the os subfibulari. And if they're asymptomatic, they're really of little concern. They're just growth centers. Um, but tenderness there may indicate injury. So those aren't just hanging out there. They're connected by a cartilage bridge. And just like um, the physis, you can injure through that uh, connection. And so there is some risk of sort of undertreatment as well as overtreatment. So you really want to put, you know, the history, the physical exam, your radiographs all together and figure out if this is something acute or um, maybe something not to worry about. You would treat, if you were worried about it, you treat it similar to a Salter 1 fracture. So here's some more examples, a little ossification there, got ossification there. I will say that these, um, if you do injure, that often sort of accelerates the growth and it, um, they sort of fuse in faster, right? So here's actually that patient with those growth arrest lines. She had a Salter 1 fracture, had this accessory ossification center, which in hindsight, she probably injured a little bit as well um, because again, nine months later, she's, that's fused in. So you can have sort of injury or trauma can cause fusion as well over that synchrondrosis. And that's ankle fractures. So remember, know your anatomy, know what you're palpating. Um, read your own x-rays, right? So really correlate your x-rays with your patient, with the history, the timeline, because sometimes there's a question of, you know, was this here before? Is this incidental? In uh, adult fractures especially, understand the difference between stable and unstable fractures. Get those stress views. Um, get your follow-up x-rays in seven to 10 days if you have any question, because things can change, right? Muscles can pull on bones and move things around a little bit, especially in that first week. So you don't want um, to lose your patient to follow up uh, in that case. And obviously it, it affects your um, treatment plan as well. And become comfortable with reading pediatric x-rays. I think they can be daunting a bit for folks who um, are not familiar. So um, it's really volume. The more you see, the more you see. Um, so read those and remember the vulnerability of the physis. And thank you for your attention today. Thank you. That was great. Um, I feel like ankle injuries are so common, and especially with the imagery, imaging, it was really nice and helpful for young attendings and the fellows to get those correlated right now with the, that great lecture. Thanks. Um, I know. I, let me check to see if we have any questions. Uh, don't forget to fill out the survey that Andy posted. I don't see any questions yet, but I have one for you. Um, what is your experience with surgery and ortho referrals for high ankle sprains? I know it's not exactly a fracture, but and it runs along the lines of it. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's the same, right? If you get an x-ray or you're clinically concerned for a high ankle sprain, and usually there's an x-ray then done. Um, all right, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but those stress views would be key, right? So you're really wondering if there's instability or not. And so you can either do the dorsiflexion external rotation actually hold the patient, right, while you're getting x-rays, or you can use fluoro for that as well. Um, or gravity, is, as long as they're really weight-bearing, that can be a good view. Sometimes it takes a few days before they can really put enough weight on it to get a good view. If it's stable and you're, you know, you're comfortable with that, um, that doesn't need to be stabilized, basically. <laughs> um, but if you have any concern about that, Right, so even if you don't have a fracture, sometimes those do require uh, fixation just um, because of the syndesmotic injury. 
Is that what you're asking? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, and, and just um, kind of what you tend to see the surgeons actually do surgery on versus not do surgery on. So you, I mean, you essentially answered. Um, thank you. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Thank you for staying on Dr. De Luigi as well. Um, I don't see any other questions and, you know, we're about six minutes over. Thank you to both of you for those two wonderful lectures. Very high yield and important. Um, I think we'll, we'll say this is it for today. And thanks again for tuning in. Oh, wait one comment, but thank you again for tuning into this online fellow education lecture series. Um, thank you to our speakers. And it was just another thank you from one of our subcommittee co-chairs, Dr. Jank out in Arizona. Um, but if either of you have anything left to say, I'll let you go, but otherwise we'll finish up for today. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Thanks, for Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, for everybody, for coming. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. You too. Bye. Thank you.